Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Both Derek and Josh sent me a story out of Canada, and it's an interesting story because it could have happened here. There's a lesson to be learned here for all of us, but from the CBC, Enterprise charges customer more than $3,300 for damage incurred after the truck was returned. A man rented a truck from Enterprise, used the truck, returned the truck, and then after the truck was returned to Enterprise, they said, oh, there's damage on this truck that you are liable for, even though the truck had been returned to us. So here's the deal. Erica Johnson wrote this story. Samuel Wardlaw is the guy who rented the truck. Uh, he was expected to pay about 200 bucks for renting the truck. And instead, Enterprise Rent-A-Car added $3,300 to the bill because the truck got damaged after he dropped it off. He only used the truck for five hours to move some belongings to a new apartment. A week later, he got an unexpected email from Enterprise that said he was responsible for damage that occurred on the Enterprise lot after hours. He returned the truck after hours. It was on the Enterprise lot, which is something they said he could do. And they said, well, something happened to it on our lot after you returned it, therefore you're liable. It's iffy, but we'll get to that. The email didn't explain what had happened or why he would be responsible. But of course, it worried him that he may have to pay $3,300 on top of the 200 bucks he already paid. And he said, I was anxious about what the price is going to be. So to see over $3,300 in damage, I was totally shocked. Enterprise later said that Wardlaw parked the truck and put the keys in a secure drop box as instructed by an employee. The truck was out there on the lot and someone stole its catalytic converter. Uh, Enterprise pointed to a clause on page 7 of its rental agreement. <laughs> Have you rented a vehicle lately? Contracts are quite lengthy. And in very, very small print, page 7 says drivers who drop off a vehicle after hours are responsible for damage or theft until it's checked in by an employee. Now, here's the problem. If you put something in a contract and somebody signs it, they can be held liable for that unless it's an unconscionable term. The question is, would this be unconscionable? But the weird part about it is that most people would say, wait, you got 20 trucks parked in the lot. And I bring in another truck, so it's truck number 21. Let's assume that they're all in the same lot. And someone steals something from this truck. I'm responsible for it. Someone steals something from that truck. You guys will take care of it with your insurance because it was just a vehicle sitting there. And so you wonder why their insurance wouldn't cover this vehicle. It was just dropped off. Um, it's their truck, their lot, their catalytic converter is what Ward Law says. Everything about it is within Enterprise's control. For them to say it's my liability is pretty ridiculous. After the people at CBC got involved, they got a program called Go Public. Enterprise said in an email it had decided not to pursue the claim. The company did not explain why and said no one was available for an interview. So it ended well, but it makes you wonder what would have happened if the guy hadn't contacted the media. Go Public has checked the terms and conditions for the three major companies that account for 95% of all rentals in Canada, which, by the way, would be Enterprise, Avis, and Hertz. And uh, all the contracts contain similar clauses, claiming that drivers are responsible for any damage or theft from the time they drop off a vehicle until it is checked back in. A consumer advocate and lawyer says Enterprise and other car rental giants give the impression there's no downside to dropping off a vehicle after hours. But of course, if you sign the contract, you're presumed to have read it and understood it. Um, I can think of an example where I dropped off a vehicle after hours, actually before hours, where it's a very, very small rental desk at an airport, I believe in Tulsa. And I had a vehicle over the weekend and I was flying out really, really early, either Sunday morning or Monday morning. It was Monday morning. And I got there. No one was there. So they said, you know, if you get here... When we're closed, just put it in one of these spots here and put the keys in the drop box. And I did that. And now I'm starting to wonder what that contract said. <laughs> We've all been there. The company says no problem. Stick the keys to the slot in the door, said Jennifer Marston, who works with the free legal clinic Pro Bono Ontario. But how many times do they say to you, if anything happens and the car is parked in the lot, you're responsible? It's never happened to me, she said. Of course, they've never said that to you, but it was in the contract you signed. So let's keep this clear. Wardlaw says when he arrived to pick up the truck, there was little discussion about the terms and conditions. 
in the 30-page contract. <laughs> 30 pages. They told me that since they're going to be closed at 12 o'clock that day and I'd be returning at around 1 to just put the keys to the drop-off slot when I return the vehicle. Marston says big rental car outfits can't hide behind lengthy contracts they know most people won't read and may not understand when they contain ambiguous or unusual terms. The question is how ambiguous or unusual is this? They wrote it. They had the opportunity to put more effort into making it clear, and they didn't. Well, I, I kind of agree with that. She says legal precedent exists in an Ontario case, which found a rental car company was required to bring unexpected terms to the attention of the consumer if it wants them to be enforceable. So what happened is, over time, someone once had a rental contract. It's probably a page long. Here's how much it costs per hour. Return it undamaged. Sign here. And then as lawyers got involved and litigation ensued, those contracts got longer, 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 thicker, 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 to where you now have a 30-page contract. And by the way, it's also available in French because this is Canada we're talking about. And those long contracts that protect them do eventually get to the point where it hurts them because the courts do say, in Ontario apparently, if you make the contract that lengthy and thick and you know no one reads it, you can't hide stuff in there. That's crazy. And I've told the story once or twice. I'm going to tell it again. I was in France, the country, <laughs> decade or two ago. France. Had the opportunity to rent a car. I saw a sign that I recognized, I think it was Enterprise, that looked like the Enterprise signs in America, but it, it, it was in French. Walked in and said to the kind lady behind the counter, do you speak English? And she said, yes, I do. I said, I would like to rent a car. She said, great. I said, I'm an American tourist. She said, okay. And so I gave her some identification, credit card, all that stuff. And how long do you need the car for? I go, one day. And she then hands me a contract to sign that is in French. And I will, and I've, I've, I, I've admitted this to people. <laughs> I'm not that ashamed of it because it ended well. But I signed that contract. And on the contract, the only thing I could make out was my name and address, the daily rate, and how many days I was being charged. I have a rudimentary understanding of some French. Very, very small amount. Very small amount. But I signed a contract that was entirely in French. What did it say? I have no idea. I'm guessing it said roughly the same thing that the contracts say in America. But I, I, I can't. I can't can't prove that but i drove the car went and visited the beaches of normandy and the cemetery and aromanche a bunch of other places up and down the normandy coast brought the car back turned it back in walked away from it and that's fine but there was a period of time where i'm driving that car thinking to myself hmm i wonder what that contract said <laughs> when there is an onerous term in the contract a heavy term that puts a big burden on someone if it's buried in the fine print then the company in a consumer transaction like this has the responsibility to bring that to the consumer's attention. That is at least according to that ruling in Ontario. The companies also have to meet a standard of proof when holding customers responsible for damage, Marston said. When Enterprise told Wardlaw a thief had stolen the catalytic converter, it sent photographs of the damage which were not timestamped. We don't know when those photos are taken, Marston said. Maybe they're taken a week later. The burden is on the company to prove that. She says, people caught in a dispute need to know one thing. The rental company isn't the judge. And that's true. And a lot of people, when they deal with a business who sends them a bill, will simply pay it. Oh, what am I going to do? Pay it. Well, nowadays, you can call around and talk to an attorney or somebody or call the media. But the advice that I would give you is, number one, read everything you sign. And if you spot a term in a contract that scares you like that, you either want to not sign the contract, ask if you can strike it, and they'll say no. Or simply understand that that puts a heavier burden on you if you're dropping off the vehicle after hours. So if you're going to rent the vehicle and the place closes at 5 o'clock and you're not going to be done until 7. And you say, can I drop it off at 7 o'clock tonight? They say, yeah, drop it off out front. Put the keys in the box. If it's an area where somebody might come by and take a uh, reciprocating saw and chop off the catalytic converter... You might want to say, you know something, what's it cost me to rent it till the following morning? I'll drop it off at 9 a.m. when you guys open. You might, you might want to do that. The other thing you can do 
is you could document the condition of the vehicle yourself. But the question then becomes, if you drop the vehicle off in pristine condition and something happens to it after that, before they check it in, they're still going to say, hey, it's your fault. You know, so I've rented a lot of vehicles in my life. And the vast majority of them I dropped off at the airport where the counters are manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at least at like Detroit Metro. And so I dropped off vehicles at all hours, all days, all times, doesn't matter. And somebody comes out, walks around the car, hits print, and hands you the receipt. And you're not even three feet from the car when they do that. So you're there, they're there, and they've signed off on the car. If you're dropping off a vehicle after hours, be aware of the fact that this argument could arise. You could avoid all trouble and not have it happen, or it could arise and then you're stuck in the situation. The situation being that you're fighting with them over damage that got done to the vehicle after you dropped it off. And you can prove you dropped it off in pristine condition, but they're going to say, well, contract says, at which point you may have to argue a little bit about it. So Derek and Josh, thanks for the story from the CBC or cbc.ca. Enterprise charges customer more than $3,300 for damage incurred after a truck returned. However, they let him off once the media got involved. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. What separates a funny movie from a good movie is something personal.